the 10th anniversary commemoration of Kojoba Redu, and it's been uh, uh, marked with a a lecture on protecting the public pairs that's going on at the Kofi Annan India ICT Center here in Accra. We'll be going there to you. Uh, we understand that Professor H. Kwesi Pempe is speaking now. Why don't we go over there? Because he really was an exceptional public servant. And I think I'm really glad that some organization that found, has found it worth the while to actually institute these memorial lectures um, in his name and in his honor. And I, I commend you for that. Um, I also, of course, know the, the, the chairperson for uh, today's occasion. Uh, but I know him, like most of you, primarily by reputation. Uh, he has managed to capture the imagination of many Ghanaians, uh, and it, I think, testifies to the thirst for a certain quality of public service. The fact that we have a commemoration for Barry Edu, as well as the kind of sentiment that I feel uh, expressed towards uh, the current Auditor General really testifies to the fact that there is indeed a shortage of such talent in our, our, our current environment, and there is a public yearning for a certain quality of public service and of a public servant. And I think he definitely epitomizes that. Um, like uh, uh, George said, the full resume of the Auditor General Daniel Yao Domlevo is definitely uh, before you. So I will not take too much of your time, but I would invite you to actually read it. Uh, he's, of course, um, a, a, a professional chartered accountant, uh, as one ought to be to become an Auditor General. But he has an extensive, it comes to the job with extensive experience, not just locally, but internationally, uh, including with reputable multilateral organizations. And um, I remember that when uh, uh, his appointment was announced, you know, it was in a certain cloud, it was caught in a certain cloud of controversy because it was one of these transitional type of announcements. And, but everybody that I spoke to around that time, who did not like the idea of these last minute appointments, made an exception somewhat for this gentleman. I did not know him, but I, I spoke to quite a few people who said, well, I understand that the Auditor General guy is very good. You know, so, and he has actually lived up to the reputation. Uh, since his appointment, uh, he has taken a number of uh, bold steps and bold initiatives that I think um, uh, should augur well for public, uh, the management of public finances in our country if we take it seriously. Uh, I will not uh, go on further. I'll just invite you to really uh, take a look at his, his life of accomplishment. But for now, I'll just invite him uh, to uh, the podium to give us the wisdom. That is the reason why we are here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Daniel Yao Domlevo. Thank you for those kind words, Prof. The Chairman, Professor Kwesi Prempe, Dr. Robe, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to turn, uh, join me to thank Dr. Brobe, the Chief Policy Analyst, Ghana Institute for Policy, Public Policy Options, GIPO, and other organizers of this lecture on management and accounting for Ghana's public finance dedicated to the life and work of the Honorable Kwejo Bauredu, a chartered accountant and a politician who died in office while serving our beloved country as the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning under His Excellency President John Ajekum Kufo. I thank them not only for the honor done me by inviting me to this August annual lecture, but also for the privilege 
to deliver the lecture for this year, which is also marking the 10th anniversary of his demise. demise. I must confess that I would have preferred listening to the Honorable Kwajuba Uredu deliver this lecture on protecting the public purse, keeping the gate shut before the horse bolts instead. But God knows best. May his gentle soul continue to rest in peace. Amen. Amen. I knew Honorable Bauredu in professional circles, but from a long distance. And these were, these were years before he became a politician or a minister. Those who know me will know that I was born in a small village in Afram Place. It is called Adiamra. It's just about a kilometer and a half or two kilometers away from Donkokro. And I used to go there very often. So on one of my visits going to see my parents, I ran into Honorable Kwaju Bauredu at the river called Kwau Adoso. And since he was not familiar with the place, he didn't know the protocols of going on the ferry. So when the time came for us to go on the ferry, his driver couldn't get space on the ferry. So he was left behind. I recognized him, so I came down from the ferry so that I'll make way for him to go. But the next driver will not agree. He said, if you are not going, then I should go, not him. And I was trying to find my way for him. So he called me near him and said, my brother, allow them. So they went. And we spent more than three hours together. And that is where we started talking about several issues. And from that day, he always called me my village brother. He never called me by name. I really admired his humility. But the one thing about him which I wish God gave me was the retentive memory that he had. He could be talking to you and refer to a page in his budget statement, a page in daily graphic, a page in Hamza Wu. And I started learning some of those things. So if my staff are surprised the rate at which I quote the Constitution, it is from this great man. <laughs> Today's topic, protecting the public purse, keeping the gate shut before the horse bolts, calls for being proactive in ensuring that we stop the leakages of public funds and not only rely on corrective measures, which some may say closing the gate after the horse has bolted. In fact, if there is one institution that all over the world is accused of closing the gate after the horse has bolted, it is the Supreme Auditors or the Auditors General. Chasing or running after the horse has been the traditional preoccupation of the Auditor General and hence the constitutional mandate under Article 187 of the Constitution, which provides that within six months after the financial year, the Auditor General shall submit his report to Parliament. In other words, tell Ghanaians of the various gates, that is, ministry, departments, agencies, through which the horses voted. So you tell this one, stole this one, this one he passed here, this one jumped through here, and is gone. That's what we are expected to be doing. In my humble opinion, I can, we can ensure that the public funds are safe only when we have an effective and efficient public financial management system in place. The effectiveness and efficiency of public financial management systems are not logical outcomes of pouring the most expensive or procuring the most expensive IT infrastructure. Else, Ghana will have had one of the best PFM systems in the world. In fact, on the, in the international circles, whenever they are referring to expensive PFM systems, Ghana usually come on top. So Ghana has spent more than $100 million, and they can still find 
their PFM system working. One cannot achieve effectiveness and efficiency simply by organizing workshops, trainings, and visits abroad. The most important ingredient, in my opinion, which is lacking in Ghana and most countries in the region is discipline. Without an effective and efficient PFM system, the horse will never be found in the stable to always boot. Mr. Chairman, an effective and efficient public financial management should have at least four outcomes. Those who have been following PIFA, Public Expenditure and Financial Accountability Framework, which is propagated by World Bank and IMF, there are three. But some of us are forcefully fighting for the fourth one, and I'll come to it, and you'll get to know why. According to PIFA or IMF World Bank Financial Management Framework, a good financial management system should result in aggregate fiscal discipline. We must cut our coat according to our size said that we don't leave debt for generations yet unborn. So government must live within a certain limit, fiscally responsible. A second requirement is strategic allocation of resources. We cannot just use our money, but we must use the money to develop the country. So if we say we want good roads, can we say that the budget is speaking to that? If we, want, we say we want quality education, is our budget speaking to that? Because the budget is the tool for resource allocation. So there must be strategic allocation of resources. The third one, for which public service actually exists, is that the public financial management should lead to efficient service delivery. If you are putting more money into health, when you go to the hospital, you get the services that is supposed to be rendered or we put more money into education, but when you go, the teachers are busy doing something else. So these are the three outcomes expected of public financial management system. But some of us have added a fourth leg, which is eradicating corruption or minimizing corruption. You can't say I have a good public financial management system, but people are stealing the money. We find it unacceptable where there is so much abuses in the system. Meanwhile, we say we have a good, a robust public financial management system. And I may be visiting these four topics or outcomes in my speech from time to time, but I'll be dwelling on the fourth one, which is eradicating corruption most of the time. In fact, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Eradicating corruption sounds to be something which is perfect and unattainable. So I was very reluctant using the phrase, even though it is in our constitution. So I started searching the meaning for the word eradicating corruption. What I found even disturbed me more. First, I saw to destroy cor corruption completely. And I said, in Ghana here, it will work. Put an end to corruption, I said the same thing. Then I got to get rid of corruption. I moved on, I saw eliminate corruption. Do away with corruption. I was getting worried, I said, these meanings, I don't think they are attainable. But I saw another one who says, suppress corruption. I said, that is what Ghana can do. <laughs> So, so I, don't, I think that's where we are going towards. We want to reduce it a bit, but eradicating it, <laughs> I don't know if we can do it. And so I term it a future impossible test. It's not going to happen because we are told corruption has been with us since Adam. And today corruption is really, I think, the widest religion in the world. It cuts across all religions, all tribes, all nationalities, Racist, etc. I don't think there is any religion as big as corruption. And it doesn't have anything to do with the type of country you are in. Be it a developed or developing country, there is corruption everywhere. Mr. Chairman, please.
Permit me to honor the memory of the late Kojo Banredu by visiting paragraph three of the concept note shared with me by Dr. Brobe, which states that the Honorable Kojo Banredu's tenor as the finance and economic minister was anchored on two irremovable pillars, namely, the public finances of Ghana must be managed and accounted for as prescribed by the Constitution of Ghana. That was the first pillar. Two, that public service is an honor and recognition which was to be reciprocated through excellence in performance and humility at all times. So if you find yourself in public service, you have been done an honor. And you should reciprocate it by rendering service. That is his position. I will go first on the first pillar, which is public finance of Ghana must be managed and accounted for as prescribed by the constitution of Ghana. And that takes my mind straight to the directive principles of state policy. Mr. Chairman, since of the constitution contains the directive principles of state policy, which according to Article 34, shall guide all citizens, parliament, the president, the judiciary, the council of state, the cabinet, the political parties, the, and other bodies and persons in applying or interpreting the constitution and any other law, and in taking and implementing any policy decisions for the establishment of a just and free society in the country. So directive principles of state policy binds everybody, for be you a president, a judge, etc. The constitution says you must abide by the directive principles of state policy. So no Ghanaian is above that directive. Now, it provides that the state shall take appropriate measures to make democracy a reality by decentralizing the administrative and financial machinery of government to the regions and districts. I would like to take this one again. The Constitution says, the state shall take appropriate measures to make democracy a reality by decentralizing the administrative and financial machinery of government to the regions and the districts, and also to take steps to eradicate corrupt practices and abuse of power. Now, after 25 years of going into that constitution, what do we see on the ground? I must admit that for political and administrative decentralization, Ghana has done a lot. Every constituency has got an MP. We have district offices, we have regional offices. So those ones are okay. But when it comes to fiscal decentralization, the financial administration, the decentralization is still within one kilometer square, Mr. Chairman. We decentralize from Ministry of Finance to Agri, Health, Education, etc. One kilometer square in Ghana. That is all. In fact, it is even unfair to Accra people to say that decentralization is within Accra. It's just about, let's even increase it to two kilometers square. Then you have covered Ghana's decentralization. So as we speak today, if a teacher or a nurse or a public servant is employed in my favorite village, Bungburugu, uh, Boku, or Lora, or whatever, he or she, the data has to come all the way to Accra for this data to be captured onto the payroll system. No wonder we have so many ghosts, and now we are chasing the ghosts. I want to put this in context. We have close to six. 160,000 people on the government payroll. If we assume that people start work at the age of 20, it means their working life is on the average 40 years, which means that each year about 6,500 people have to leave the payroll on the average. And being a long, the longest serving director of payroll, I can tell you that during my tenure as the director of payroll, about that figure, between 12,000 and 15,000 people left the payroll each year. So even if we leave half, 
of 12,000 on the payroll. You are talking about 6,000 6, people on the payroll wrongly. However, the payroll is only in Accra. Given the fact that some of you, even as you listen to me, I'm sure you are checking your emails and your WhatsApp messages. In fact, even in your farms, at times you check your messages. Today's day and age, people have to travel all the way to Accra. So the question I ask is, if a teacher or a worker has to come from Accra, uh, Boko to Accra, then does it make any difference whether you are going to Ministry of Finance or Agri? It is the so decentralization should be geographical. It should not be ministries. We don't decentralize our budgets to ministries. We should decentralize our budgets to regions and districts. Therefore, a contractor who has been paid, uh, who has worked for government to be paid, should be paid in the region or in the district. You know what it takes to collect your money from the center? You know, when you come, uh, those who have worked in public service or continue working in the public service, I hope you know what it takes for people to get their payment. Always your claim cannot be found because you didn't put any weight on it. It's blown off. You have to bring another submission. You bring the next time, they look at you. So this is a new, a new one you are bringing. Is that not it? Put it there. By the time you come back, we can't find it until you wake up and understand the story that you have to do something. So you do that thing, and immediately you get paid. And do you think that the gentleman, when he goes back to Tamale, is for free? He's not here for charity. So he's also going to recoup plus interest. So if you paid 100 here, he may go and collect 150 in Tamale. So that is the bane of the public service that we have in Ghana. I submit that I find it very disturbing to see the number of funds created in the public sector. Apart from the consolidated fund, we have district assembly common fund, we have road fund, gate fund, so many funds. Even we have the constituency development fund, donor funds, internally generated fund. And after we have divided the money into funds, please understand where I'm coming from. Each of the funds is an overhead on the public funds. Because if you take controller and accountant general's department, their total expenditure is an overhead on consolidated fund. So is the total expenditure of gate fund on that fund, road fund, whatever fund. In my candid opinion, the constitution recognizes only one fund that we cannot do without, apart from the consolidated fund, which is the district assembly common fund. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately because I think it's very unfortunate the framers of the constitution say not, le not more than, is it not less, yeah, not less than 5% should be put in there. They should have said not more than 5% should be kept in the center. The rest should go. Because that's where we have the activity. I don't understand why we should keep the huge money in the center. And I ask a very simple question. Do you know when the money is shared according to the ministries, what happens then? The ministry takes the alliance share and gives a part of it to the department. Department also does the same and gives the remaining to maybe the unit, then to the region, then to the district. By the time it reaches the school, it's finished. So in public financial management, you see the money storming at the top. And the worst part of it is there should be a corona outbreak or a health hazard. And the budget is in Accra. I don't think we can develop our country if we have to do that. My candid advice or recommendation is that emphasis should move away from ministries, departments, and agencies, and it should go to the district and the region. I think it is time we start putting our budget together under the regional minister and asking him or her to come and defend his budget in parliament because he has a constituency. The sector minister doesn't have a constituency. Remember, Ghana is one person's constituency. That's the president. After the president, the next person who has a constituency is the regional minister. 
and below him is another constituency, which is the district. They have geographical area that they are responsible for. So why would you not give their resources to them? Mr. Chairman, I also submit that effective fiscal decentralization can put a check on the corruption because it brings about a better transparency because the budget or the resources will be broken into smaller pieces. So we know the total resource envelope, which is for a particular district or region. For instance, assuming that five million is allocated to a district, do you think somebody can take the whole five million and we will not know that this year no money came because this is all that government gave us? And you'll be naive enough to take everything. At least you take something, but not everything. So I've been comparing it to this, and I've been drawing this analogy, that if we should go to the sea and we line up hundreds of tankers to draw water from it, and after they have left and you came, you may not even know that they've taken any water from the place. Is that not it? But then if you sip from that glass, you will see a reduction in the quantum of the water. So the smaller it is, the more transparent it becomes. Because all the money for the district is 10 million. Can you steal 10 million? Or can you steal 12 million out of 10? It's not possible. And again, I even argue that centralization facilitates illicit financial flows out of our country. Because all the money is in Accra, in the pocket of the big boys. You know, when there are small boys in the regions and districts, every stealing is bad, though. But if they steal money, which they cannot account for, they hide to the cities and hide it. So the money is still within the economy. When the big boys steal money, they go abroad. That's a leakage. Because they can fly tonight. They have offshore accounts. My brothers in the regions and this is, many don't even have passport <laughs> before talking about visa. But those of us here, I'm sure most of us have visa in our passports. So we can fly tonight when we steal money. I'm not saying that people in the village will start stealing. But I'm trying to say decentralized corruption is better than centralized corruption. So if we can have a look at this decentralization, I think it will be very good. I also want to beg your permission and move on to the second pillar that Honorable uh, Kweju Bahre stood for. That is public service is an honor and we should, we should reciprocate it with excellence service. Please allow me to quickly move into this and say that it's also a very dear topic to me. The question, Mr. Chairman, I like usually ask is, who is a public servant? I humbly submit that I understand the word public, and I also understand the word servant. But when you put the two together, I get confused. I don't know whether a public servant is the one served by the public or the one who serves the public. But if you look at Ghana, I think public servant is the one served by the public. Mr. Chairman, I hope you agree with me. <laughs> Because if he's really someone who serves the public, then why is it that it's so difficult for you to enter his office? You're going to see your servant. And when you're going, your heart is beating. You say, what kind of servant is this? So definitely the meaning of public servant in Ghana is the one served by the public, not the one who serves the public. And unfortunately, some of my colleague public servants see their appointment as time to loot public funds. They join what Kwesi Pratt terms the looting brigade. And the accounts have it, meaning everyone benefits from his work. Is that not it? But in Ghana, we are eating the work itself. We are not benefiting from our work. They are chopping down the tree. They don't take benefit, they don't benefit from the fruits, no. And I think it is high time we have a second look at it. It doesn't matter which public servant we are talking about. I don't know how many of you here are public servants. And how many of you can tell me the time you reported for work today? 
go to public offices at 8 o'clock. But let me be honest and tell you that at least for the one year and nine months that I've been in office, once I'm in Accra, you'll find me in the office latest 7.15, I'll be in the office. Between 6.30 and 7.15, our bow must be in the office. 9.30, you are looking for your staff and they are not there. You call and say, sir, and the traffic power. <laughs> and I ask them, do, do I look like I sleep here? <laughs> Didn't they also come from the house? And people don't think that this is corruption. It is one of the widespread corruption. And that gentleman or lady, who comes to work at 10 o'clock, by 3 o'clock he is gone or she is gone. And then they have the guts to call other people corrupt. They forget that they are also corrupt because they are paid for eight hours and they deliver maybe four, five, or six. That's also a form of corruption. And if you aggregate it, it's huge. We have to look at it. Mr. Chairman, I've heard this mantra over and over that the private sector is the engine of growth, which I would not like to dispute at all. But I want to submit that no matter how good an engine is or new an engine is, it cannot function well if the oil is dirty. Is that not it? So the public sector is the engine. Sorry, the private sector is the engine. But public sector is the fuel that powers the engine. And if our oil is dirty, no wonder the country is not moving at the speed at which we are supposed to move. What business can you start in Ghana without the public sector? Or what can you do? If you want to do business by importing, public sector will be there. If you want to start up your, your house or accommodation, you need permits all over from the public sector. So we need a public sector which is up and doing. And I think it is time we look again at the rules. There should be consequences for non-performance. And there should be consequences for indiscipline in the public sector. We don't have to look far. Some of us were privileged working with the World Bank, I visited Rwanda years ago, and it was looking like, I don't want to mention any town, somebody think I've uh, not respected this village, so let me leave it there. But if you go to Rwanda today, unless you close your eyes, you can't help than to admire them. You say, wow, things are orderly, neat, clean. And they, about 20 years ago, where humanity uh, were coming out of a genocide which had broken down almost everything. And they have been able to do this. Mr. Chairman, what impressed me about them is not the fact that government is on the forefront of doing this. Because government is doing it, it has affected the whole society. If you go to even individual homes, you see that they are clean. That's how public policy affects the behavior of people. Immediately, government is disciplined. You must be disciplined. Because assuming we have a police today who will not take bribe, no matter who you are, you are going to face the law. And everything in government is moving. You can't help them to also behave. I've many times been telling my colleagues who are outside the country, I don't think you are more disciplined than us. It is the system which is making you disciplined. True or false? And I have a friend of mine I use always, for example, he picked me from my house, we went to Kutoka, and we flew to London. And the sister came to meet us, and he took the car and he was driving again. So I asked him, Nana, what has changed? And he said, why? He said, the way you were, you were driving yesterday, if you were driving today like that, you will have killed about 10 people. <laughs> then he said, oh, <laughs> yeah, the system will not allow you. <laughs> so it's the matter of system. So we should emphasize system instead of people. But remember, it's not going to be easy. And I want to plead with my colleague public servants that I think our job is to serve the people. And we should not use our appointments for our personal economic recovery programs. It is interesting that immediately you are appointed into office, including myself, you get calls. When is the party? And say, but I've not done anything yet. Maybe I may be a square peg in that round hole. <laughs> I've not even been to a Zoom office. And say, you want to start celebrating what? So we should 
But in fact, if the celebration is that you have even gotten an opportunity to go and serve, I can understand. But the celebration is that it is our time to chop. <laughs> and I think that is not very helpful for our country. I would like to submit here and now that when appointing people into public offices, we should get those who can do the work, else we are never going to achieve the development that we are all waiting for. And the Ghana Beyond Aid mantra will remain a mere slogan. We must get the people who can do the work. And I always tell my colleagues that there's no way you can win a football match if you are fielding volleyball players. You can use volleyball players to go and play football. When the ball goes up, instead of using their head, they use their hand, and there'll be penalty, and vice versa. If you want to win a volleyball match, you don't use footballers. But that is what happens in Ghana. Once he's a player, he can play anything at all. Mr. Chairman, some have given up on our country, but some of us are full of hope. Looking at our history and learning from other success stories, I submit that if only we are serious with getting the right man or woman for the job and also committed to fighting corruption with all the seriousness that it deserves, we shall be there sooner than later. I have a few recommendations going forward, Mr. Chairman. The first one, obviously, is discipline. I think discipline must be revived in the public service. There seems to be no consequences for violating of rules or being unproductive. Too many people do very little in the public service. I must say that there are very, very hard-working public servants, and I salute them. But for one hard-working public servant that you find, there are several others who are just occupying space. And I think it would be better for us if they would like to go home. The second issue I submit that we must have to look at quickly is the role of internal auditors in providing assurance to management that controls and systems are working. From my point of view, internal audit is the eye and the ear of management, and hence, they must have to work together closely. Management and internal auditors, they must work closely to ensure that resources are being protected and the institution is delivering on its mandate. If that is done, the work of the external auditor becomes lighter. And the Public Financial Management Act establishes a linkage between internal audit and external audit, that each quarterly report that they produce should come to the external auditor. So if the internal auditor is effective and he sees leakages in the system and he wants to stop it, but he can't even stop it, the external auditor, being myself, I will see it. And you know, I'll arrive there with my certificate of disallowance. And if you pay, I say charge. So that's how we can promptly protect the public purse. I think we need to revise the law on internal audit in the public sector. So to make all the staff who are doing internal audit a bit independent from the principal spending offices. With due apology, they are the biggest corporates anyway. The infractions, they commit more than, in fact, the higher you go, the more you sin in the public sector. So they commit the greater part of the infractions. So they should be insulated from them and put under the agency. If that is done, it is my considered opinion that they will have an improved condition of service or schemes of service. And of course, their remunerations will also be taken care of. But that is not the most important thing. The most important part of it is that there will be professional development and they can be made to follow international standards in the course of the internal auditing. And if they do their work professionally, the external auditor can now rely on the internal auditor. So the burden on us will not be as heavy as it is today. Today we do a lot of work on the ground because, in fact, most of the internal audit units, we can't trust them. 
And Mr. Chairman, let me reveal something to you. Since I took office as the Auditor General, several internal auditors have come and they want to cross over to join audit service. You may think it's because of salary. When I ask them, that is not the reason. They say they are suffering professional abuse because you write a report and you give it to the chief director, he calls you and says, are you part of us? Oh, you're not part of us. You mean you are here and you are writing this? Well, there is a vacancy in Boku. If you want to go, then we can send you there because the gentleman there wants to come to Accra anyway. Then you say, okay, chief, I'm coming. At times, some of them even mark what you should take out of the report. So I've been encouraging them that when they say take them out, please send me the original, a blank copy. And if you like, if you remove your name from it, just let me know which ministry and what are the transactions. I'll send my team there to come and review the transaction and we take it up from there because it's a collective responsibility. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I also want to submit that there is the need for us to resource the anti-corruption agencies and allow them to play their roles without interference or I've heard, is it intervention? I've heard it's intervention sort of interference, eh? Okay, so without intervention or interference. And I would like to say that I am very grateful, Mr. Chairman, to His Excellency the President for establishing the office of the Special Prosecutor who is ready to work with me and our collaboration, I believe, can bring about the deterrence that we require in the public sector. But I want to submit that the special prosecutor is not sitting well at all. There is no way he can be effective where he is seated. I want to invite all of you to visit him. I won't tell you why. Go and visit him and you see whether you can be effective given that you have one deputy, one secretary, and no investigator, no prosecutor, nothing. I don't think one man can do that. So my submission is that if we want to do something, let's do it well. And I believe if that office is well resourced, it will help Ghana to go forward again. Mr. Chairman, I also want to submit that the practice of bringing back former public servants to their old positions or bringing former chief executives as board members leaves a lot to be desired. Because clearly there will be conflict. Since I came to office, I've recruited more than 200 people last year and this year. And a whole lot of people will owe me allegiance. If you bring me back years later as the board member or board chairman, I can easily undermine the incumbent who is there. So we may have to have a second look at this. And some of the board members, immediately they are appointed, they think it is their second coming, their second coming of Christ. So immediately arrive, we, we, we won't do this, we don't allow this, we don't like this. Even when you draw their attention to law, you find board members thinking that they can override laws. It's a bit disturbing that not even ordinary laws. At times, we are talking about the supreme law of Ghana, the constitution, and you hear members. Some of them are even learned. They say, and so what? We are the board. We are in charge. I would like to offer some few advice uh, points here. I want to say that, yes, public service of Ghana, from my point of view, is governed by laws, and therefore, the universal principles of corporate governance cannot override the laws of Ghana. I hear some people talking about being champions of corporate governance. And somebody was even saying, the governor of Bank of Ghana should be appointed by the chair, the board of Bank of Ghana. Auditor general should be appointed by the board. And so when you are talking about corporate governance, remember it doesn't start, it didn't start from Ghana. It's a borrowed concept to Ghana. Go back to those countries and find out whether there is a board, even for those institutions. Auditor generals don't even have boards. Ghana is one of the worst examples in, even in Africa. Sierra Leone, they borrowed our law. And when they sent it to Sierra Leone, they made the board an advisory board to the Auditor General. You go to Kenya, they have a board. 
is an advisory board to the Auditor General. If you go to many countries, they don't have it. Go to the US, go to Britain and find out. So when we are talking about corporate governance, let's not assume that we manufactured it or we invented it. It's something we have borrowed, and when you borrow something, or when you copy something, my friends, paste is special. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I want to also submit here again that <laughs> when the curtain falls, Ghanaians should learn to leave the stage. It seems when the curtain falls, the Ghanaian think it's time to go and prepare and come back which is another problem for the public service. Our constitution says that when you turn 60, go home. It's as simple as that. Immediately you reach 60 years, go home. And when I'm 60 years, I've been telling my colleagues that I won't ask for even one minute. Because I think when I'm 60 years, I must go for someone to us out. Come. People are over 60 years. And of course, yes, the constitution mandated the president to give two years two years and what? One. That is five years in addition to the 60. Some are over 70 and they are still around. And when I say they should go home, they are fighting me. Is it me? Change the law if you think the retiring age should be 80. The disturbing part of it is that we have our graduates on the street. They don't have job to do. And we think we must remain in the office. At times you see some public servants and you wonder how many times they will be 60 years. You wonder whether this is their third time or their second time they are going to be 60 years. They falsify birth certificates so to remain young. It's only when they die that you know they are at true age. The man retires, retires at 60. He dies the next year and is 82. That is what is happening in our country. That is not as disturbing as the fact that two things which disturb him, Mr. Chairman. One, they block the opportunity for the young ones to also get some work to do. It disturbs me a lot. A second portion of it is that most of these guys are on good pension. Some of them, their pension is better than even the workers' pension, especially those who get cap 30 and those type of schemes. So they get that pension and they get monthly salary and they are weak, so they come to office, productivity is about two hours a day, and that's the end of it. I don't think this is very good. I agree with those who think we should increase the pension age, but until we have issued it, uh, we have increased or changed the law, I, I will continue disturbing those who are above age. We are doing a payroll audit, and at the end of the payroll audit, you will see my report on over age people. And I've promised them that I will activate Article 1A7, Clause 7A against them. I will disallow the existence on the payroll. And the Constitution says, when I disallow, you have to go to high court and win against me before you come back. I'm going to do that. If you don't like it, beat me. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I heard this one and help us to resist oppressors' rule. I am calling on my colleague professionals in the public sector that we should stand up and defend the right always, irrespective of the forces working against us or the nature of the inducements that come our way. At times we want to blame the politicians for manipulating the professionals, but at times some of the professionals are to be blamed because you don't qualify for the job. You've gone and lobby and they put you there. And it's paid bad time and you are now complaining. You can't complain. Now who got some? It's you. So if that is not the job you can do, please, it's better you don't go there. And some people are so much afraid that anything at all that they are told to do, they would like to do it because they want to protect their job. And I also want to say that uh, Ghana Audit Service, I hope you are all aware that we were quite reluctant doing the disallowance and search charge which I just talked about. Thanks to Occupy Ghana, they occupied our office by sending us to Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court gave consequential orders. And unfortunately for me, it was my predecessor who was sent to court. 
But by the time the judgment came, I was in the seat. So even though I agree completely with the action or the decision of the court, it was still against me. So when I said I really welcomed the decision, people didn't understand me. But I want to entreat you all to read the judgment when you have time. You see the wisdom that the judges have to espouse when they talked about the judgment. The good thing, Mr. Chairman, is today is that following our implementation of disallowance and surcharge, several African countries have adopted the same law. As we speak, Liberia has passed it, Sierra Leone has passed it, Zambia has passed it into law. The latest to join us, South Africa, two weeks ago, South Africa passed the law that the Auditor General should disallow and surcharge. Because we agreed when we met that the Auditor General should go a bit above the journalists. You, you report infractions. But the Auditor General should hold people accountable. Otherwise, you are taking your job. You don't want to be a journalist. You should be officers who protect the public press. You can't say, I protect public press and I have no mandate to do anything. I also want to say that under Article 286 of the Ghanaian Constitution, a selected number of people who are public servants at a certain level are supposed to declare their assets and their liabilities. When assuming office or taking office, every four years and when they are leaving office. This has been done from time immemorial and the system has been that when you are appointed by His Excellency or you take an office which requires disclosure, you come to the Auditor General's end, you take a form, you fill it, you put it in an envelope, you seal it, and you come and submit it and say, I've declared my assets. I wonder what kind of declaration is this? Where you conceal whatever it is. But I ask my colleagues, if one day we should go to court, because the Constitution says that the court or commissioner for human rights can ask for the asset declaration. We go to court and they open the envelope and it's newspapers which is inside. What shall we say? Somebody who has declared. So we are making changes. With immediate effect, we have stopped collecting envelopes which are sealed. When you bring it sealed, you tell to open it. And you bring an ID with your signature which you use to authenticate that it is you who signed that document. I also want to announce that through the efforts of the IT guys in my office, we have developed a software which we have tested on staff, well, we have used our staff for the testing and we are happy to roll it out so that the asset declaration will be done online. It will no more be paper. So that you can be in your house and you do the declaration. But you have to go through some steps. First and foremost, you will, get, you will submit your data, you validate it to be sure that you are actually a government worker, and then we give you access to declare using the system. And we shall launch it very soon. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to corruption, I have a suggestion for this country. I have spoken about the Office of the Special Prosecutor, which is more or less decentralizing the prosecution of corruption, which I really support. But I think that is not enough. My suggestion is that we should commercialize the prosecution of corruption in this country. That is, the law should allow, whether you amend the Constitution or whatever you do, but remember we are able to create the Office of the Special Prosecutor that amending Article 88. So we should find the same way to allow private individuals to be able to prosecute corruption cases. Therefore, if I am the one to prosecute and you are my friend, so I will prosecute you, someone can take you on. So nobody is safe. And if people can actually make a living fighting corruption, I think the fight against corruption will be more, will be lawyers, accountants, etc., who are using their own pocket money to fight corruption. They are fighting for the nation. 
So if 10 million was stolen, which we would not have been able to retrieve, but by your efforts, you bring it back. If we give you 2 million, what is wrong with that? Because we are going to lose 10 million, and you brought back 10 million. So if you have brought back 10 million, we should be able to give you 2 million. And if Ghanaians know that this is done, I'm sure anytime the audit report comes, they will be scrambling, they will be fighting for it. Because they can pick from the audit report and start going. Because if we leave prosecution of corruption in the hands of few people, some people will always get away with it. But you don't know who is your enemy. So if we commercialize it, whereby individuals can take up the issue and go to court and collect the money and get their share, I'm sure people will do that. I also would like to submit that it is necessary in the public service we respect the laws of Ghana. Some corporate governance experts, like I alluded to earlier on, think there is one size which fits all. And some people also come into public service, especially government appointees, and they don't take time to read the laws. When you are going to procurement side. But that is one thing which, please permit me, I respect His Excellency President Kufofo. When the Public Financial Management Act and the Procurement Act was passed, I remember Chief, you were the Accountant General at that time. He was my then, then my boss. The President requested that the whole cabinet go into a retreat. Snipes is going to go. After Snipes, he came and sat down. You see, this man has a lot of stamina. Okay, let's see after break, Baumis, you go. Lunch time. He finished his lunch and came back. <laughs> Hence, no minister could move. <laughs> For once, we got the ministers there the whole day because the apostle was there. And actually, some of them were pitching us. Now, why do you invite the president? Eh? <laughs> but I think it was a good thing. And I think we should learn first, because the rules and the principles we use in managing our companies is very different from what pertains in the public sector. Some of those things, if we don't do that, we shall always be going contrary to the law. And when the Auditor General says this is wrong, uh, people will not like to take it. I also want to submit that let us start rewarding hard-working public servants so that others who feel, others will also feel motivated to work hard and less desist from tarnishing people's reputation, especially because we have the benefit of radio or pen or newspaper. I cannot agree more with Professor Lumumba when he said, the tragedy of Africa is that Africans are in the business of canonizing thieves. Thieves are canonized in Africa, in Ghana. There's no exception. And demonizing is saints. Sometimes, he said, and he said, those times are many. Wisdom demands that we remain silent. If you are wise, at times you just have to be silent. But, as for me, for the love of my country, and God, I will not be silent. I will say it as it is. <laughs> but someone has even promised that he's going to strip me naked. I don't know whether a daily guide has finished stripping me naked. Am I naked yet? <laughs> tell daily guide that I'm still having my clothes on. They should tell me the time frame by which they'll finish. And I also start with them. So it is not just good because you have the advantage of media. You start going to town on people or on unfounded allegations. It's not just right. We must be factual and not to tarnish people's reputation just because me, I have the power of media. I must say that the Archbishop called Felton Shine has this to say. 
and I'm very happy with the quote. I would like to quote him. He says, the refusal to take sides on great moral issue is itself a decision. If you refuse and the wrong is going on, you have taken a decision. He says, it is a silent acquiescence to evil. We are accepting evil quietly in our society. And he said, the tragedy of our time is that those who still believe in honesty lack fire and conviction. Is that not true? And he said, while those who believe in dishonesty are full of passionate conviction, the evildoer is having a loud mouth than the good people. But I think the good people in Ghana, we far outnumber the evil ones. The problem is we are quiet. We won't talk. At times, they are professionals. And I can see some in this room. Very professional people. And our banks are failing because of we professionals. Meanwhile, we won't talk. One prepares the account through window dressing approach. The other one comes and says, it's true and fair. Meanwhile, there's nothing there. True and fair financial statement. Six months, it collapses. And we are not holding them accountable. They still hold their heads high and call themselves professionals. Professionals with no dignity, with no honesty, with no integrity. We cannot uphold, we cannot continue tolerating said professionals. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I must say that if we truly, we are truly troubled by the unacceptable level of corruption that has bedeviled our society or country, and we really believe that it must stop, if we all believe that Ghana can work again and be a better place for us, then we all have a collective duty to educate, encourage, and enforce compliance with laws, rules, and regulations to protect our public funds and national interests. Professor Ajiman Bedu Akosa, a former Director General of Ghana Health Service, said, we need to remain patriotic and commit ourselves to nation building by possessing values of discipline and good morals to help promote national unity, unity and cohesion. He said there was also the need to reverse the Ghanaian attitude of no love for our country. We don't love our country. We hate our country. In fact, if there is a job to be done by a Ghanaian and we can pay 5000 we are happy paying 20000 to a foreigner. If, especially if your skin is uh, light, then that one, with them, you are gone. You can take everything, you won't complain. But if it's a Ghanaian, you will see front pages. Front page, we put you there. I thought they say charity begins at home. But in this country, I think charity begins outside. And comes home later, isn't it? So we need to love our country. And he said that, and I like to quote again, Ghana is the only country we have, and God has a reason for not creating us as Europeans or Latinos. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's show some love for Mr. Domenovo.